Are you ready to know what you don't know about social media? Well, then you're in the right place. This is the Seb Russ Show on Social Buzz on Air. Social Media Radio, bringing you tips, tricks, tools, and extreme value. Broadcasting from our studio in Miami. And now, here's your host, Sebastian Russ. What's happening, party people? Hey, welcome back to the show. Maybe it's your first time. Hey, welcome to the show. I'm your host, Sebastian Rusk. As always, hey, great to be hanging out with you. My guest this week, this guy is uber, super, crazy smart. And I found him through a Facebook post through a mutual friend. The exact words, I believe, were, this kid will absolutely blow your mind with what he knows about tax code and what he knows about the secret way to save and use your money at the same time. He wrote a book called The And Asset. Caleb Williams is currently the CEO of Better Wealth Solutions, a company committed to financial education and coaching. Let's get right down to it. Friends, please help me welcome to the show, Caleb Williams. What's happening, brother? I am so excited to be here. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Dude, I'm stoked that you're here. I can't believe we connected. I connect with so many people to get them on the show through a Facebook post. So this entire episode is dedicated to the one and only Mr. Dennis Hugh for connecting us by default. I believe he had seen you uh, speaking at an event and had used the words, uh, this kid will blow your mind. And um, it was all about uh, finances. And right. the world of finances and tax codes and assets and my brain hurts already. So <laughs> let's. Uh, Here's my promise. My promise to you and everyone listening is we're not only uh, going to make it this more clearly understood, we're going to make this fun. And it's going to be like everyone will want to be in this space after we're done talking. And man, I, again, I'm, I'm, I have so much uh, gratitude just being on with you. I love okay. your energy, by the way. I've got, I've got a ton of it. If we could figure out a way to bottle this up and sell it, we can have Dennis run the ads and then you can make sure we're spending the right amount of money on the ads uh, annually. Right. So just a back background on Dennis is he actually found me, read my book and I've shared the stage with him a couple of times. Huge, huge honor. The guy's brilliant. The guy's super connected. And he actually gave me like a backhand compliment that if you know, Dennis is an incredible compliment. He's like, yeah, I've read tons of books on finance. And while Kayla's book is pretty easy to understand, it's one of the most profound. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to actually take that as a massive compliment. Dennis. Yes, absolutely, dude. Those are great. That's a, that's a phenomenal way uh, to, to, to explain a book as anyone would want to have. All right, so let's back it up a little bit. You've got quite uh, the career story that started, that's, it started pretty early on at an early age here uh, within the realm of finance. So let's just back it up, help our listeners better understand, um, you know, from the get, really, I guess, childhood, you started to become fascinated with how right. people became rich. Uh, let's start there. Yeah, so we'll actually start with my first job, 14 years old, gutting chickens. I literally worked at a chicken farm and, and got paid a dollar per chicken that I processed. So yes, when you go to the store and you get chickens uh, and you cook them, there's things that go into getting the, the end product uh, to you. And, and what that really taught me is not only how to work hard, not only how to start thinking about things from an efficiency point of view, but it, I really started valuing money. Like I started making money and making more than just minimum wage. Like I'm, I was pretty motivated kid. And, and so I, I read this book called Richest Man of Babylon. And it was just the idea that our money could start working for us. And that's where the fascination began. And that's where I started reading books on entrepreneurship, on leadership and on, on wealth. And I actually wrote down, uh, for those of you that have read Thinking Grow Rich and know the power of writing things down, I wrote down that I want to be a Fortune 500 CEO of a company that helps people with money. And so that was like something at a young age that I knew and I was like uh, dialed in on. Awesome. So you, it's, it's funny, you know, it's, it's great that, you know, I, I didn't, when I was a kid, I, I wanted to, I wanted to be a photographer. Uh, and then when I was 18, I'm like, I can sell, let's go. <laughs> but it's fun. It's funny how things that are that are, that that where it clicks for us. You know, there's a certain there's a certain point in time, it just something just clicks and it goes. You know what? That right. that that may be the path. So um, you became fascinated with it. Your first job, gutting chickens, um, and then you got done with school. Did you go to school after high school? So, so I was homeschooled. So I was homeschooled. And one thing I'll I'll say that I my parents didn't teach me much about money. But my parents taught me how to be proactive. And so if you're if you're a parent listening to this, like when I worked with my dad. 
I used, I hated it growing up because he would like not let me stand around and wait for him to tell me what to do. He wanted me to start looking for things and be proactive. And so I'm incredibly grateful for the, for the parenting. I was homeschooled. And one another thing that you have to know is I was dyslexic. I still do struggle with dyslexia. I was incredibly short for my age. And so there was a defining moment at like 12 years old. I had this incredibly embarrassing moment where I'm like on stage at like a summer camp and I have like three lines that I have to say. And I wrote them down and, and I went on to sounding out each word on stage. And that was kind of like the pinnacle of like, what am I doing? Like I, I, I was an incredibly uh, just, I, I didn't have high confidence and I thought I would never get through school or whatever. And my mom sat down with me and pretty much said in a loving way, you can't do anything about your height. So if you grow and I'm, by the way, I'm five foot eight. So I grew, um, don't worry about it <laughs> with your, with your reading, you just have to work harder. So like I got parented and I had this community of people that supported me, but we're also like, if you're going to, if you want to um, get results, you actually have to work harder than the average person. So that went through chicken farm. And then at the age of 17, I got a job at a bank and I got the job through meeting with a guy who I wanted to, I didn't know what I wanted to go to school for. Like I, I do have a bachelor's in finance, but I didn't know what I wanted to go, go for at the time. So I sat down with him and I, and I just kind of shared what I wanted to do. And he said, young man, you need experience. Like as much as gutting chickens was like a, you know, right. good first job, like you need to like put yourself in a place uh, where you can start learning. And so he was on a board of a bank. And so he got me a job. Like literally we were in high IHOP. He pulls out his phone and just like gets me a job. Huh. So at 17 years old, five foot two, I'm like working as a teller. And another thing you have to understand about me is as a 17 year old, I'm like telling the CEO of the bank how to run this business. Like I, I cannot turn this part uh, on my brain off. And I'm like, okay, we could do this as a bank. And it was a community bank with three branches. And so we were very involved with the community. And what that taught me is not just how money works, like deposits and loans. And right. it also taught me how to start communicating with people. I was pretty shy, but it taught me on how to talk to people. And then there's that, there's that trust that you have by, I know your social security number. I know what you make. I, I know some of the most private things about your life. Right. And so at 17 years old, I learned some incredible things as it relates to money. And then I went on to different networking events. And when you're, when you're like the only high schooler, let alone college student in these networking events, and like you're going around, I, I found out real quick, I would offer to take people out to lunch. They would never let me pay. So I'd get a free lunch out of the deal. And uh, then I also get so much wisdom. Like sure. the amount of people that want to help us is incredible. Yep. And so I just was like, wow, this is, this is like, I, I love this. And so I just started gaining connections. I started going to school um, and went for business and finance. And because I was homeschooled, I got a year of college done in high school. So I ended up graduating in three years while working full time at that local bank uh, through college. And then uh, at 19 years old, so I'm going to school, working at the bank. I'm now working in our investment department as, as an investment assistant. And the guy that was running our investment department took another job. And so at 19 years old, I took over the bank's investment department, like second largest office had like, I'm literally going to school, but have like a bank phone and like access to all this stuff. And that's where my journey of like trying to figure this whole thing out really began because I knew that most people are being absolutely lied to as it relates to money. Like the, the, what we're told, especially as entrepreneurs, what we're told to do with our money is like so wrong like we oh it just it just boils my blood and and i started learning number one what the banks were doing what how corporations are thinking about their money how the wealthy are thinking about their money i started actually going and learning from people that were thinking and truly like not turning their brain off as it relates to this and i i pretty much made a commitment like if i'm going to find a better way i'm not just going to sit back and let people come to me but i'm going to be more proactive and share this with the world yeah and so that's where that I'm after graduating college, uh, started better wealth solutions. I, it, I, I'm pretty young. I'm just turned 23 and uh, better wealth solutions has been in business for a little over two and a half years. We have clients all over the country. We're big in education, but then we actually help people implement these strategies and, um, help them understand that, you know, we, we could go into that if you want, but like, that's kind of our business model. We use the power of the internet to educate and coach. That is outstanding. And congrats on all of your success, you know, and, and really being, being able to hit the ground running when it's time to adult, 
if you will. Yes. You know what I mean? Uh, so I, I kind of get that. I've always had the entrepreneur itch myself. I, you know, I, I would wash cars and mow lawns, you know, at the same time, not the same time, but I'd wash your car, then, then, then mow the grass. Right, right. And I would always identify that and figure it all out. So the hustle is, has always been uh, in my blood. Um, so, so, uh, and that's just crazy taking over the bank, not just bank manager, like head of finance. Right. So what was the first thing you implemented when you became head of finance at the bank? I a huge fan of Simon Sinek. And when people would come in for their annual review, just think about the 10 minutes of horror you would experience walking into the bank and realizing that I was your new guy. Like, I want people to understand, like, I want people to be a little bit sympathetic here. Like it was miserable. <laughs> like, I literally, like, I realized the more I talked, the less my credibility went down. So this is what I would do is I would sit down with people and I would draw this, the Simon Sinek golden circle, which is why, how, and what. People don't care what you do until they know why you, why you do what you do. And if I did one thing right, it was I got really clear on the clients that I sat down with, what they actually wanted to accomplish. Yep. And I was resourceful enough. And remember, dyslexic, right? I got through school. I learned how to get through life working and collaborating with other people. And right. so I would figure out what they wanted and then I would go and be resourceful. And in being resourceful, that's where I actually learned all this stuff. So that's the biggest thing that I learned is, is, is not try to talk, um, but listen and then genuinely try like, and that's foreign for a lot of people, but like genuinely try to solve their problem and, and help them. And that means like being resourceful and finding the best people to help them with their solution, with, with their problems. So you'd essentially reverse engineer their solution. That's right. hundred percent. Smart. So um, it's just perfect timing because I have an 18 year old and we've been working on this whole finance thing. And I don't know a lot about it, but I'm Tony Robbins is one of my mentors and he wrote a book a couple of years ago uh, where he sat down with Ray Dalio. And I don't know if you, I'm sure you've, yeah. you've read it or yeah. familiar. Okay, cool. So um, the, I, I didn't read the entire thing because it's, it's, it is an encyclopedia. Yeah. Yeah. But I did listen to some a portion of the audio, and that's still a good like two weeks of, of quality listening there. But the, the 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 number one thing that I got from him was that you know four hundred one k's as you see them are completely wrong. He went into a lot about that, um, good, bad, or different. But he also said you know it was kind of the same uh, uh, you know Dave Dave Ramsey program that's been around for several years, which is you know pay yourself first into your investment account because and the, the number one takeaway I had from Tony when I, when I read this was that if you, if, if, if it was, if, if the IRS was taking it or it was a garnishment or it had to come out, you would pay it regardless. So what's yeah. the difference between that and paying yourself? And that stuck a lot with me. And as over the yeah. past couple of years, as I've been getting this entrepreneur journey as, as stable as it could be, I've been starting to implement that. But I also have an 18 year old daughter that's getting ready to go away to college um, and I've been, you know, she's been working part-time jobs and babysitting and dog walking here and there. The power of being able to just say, hey, listen, you got a hundred bucks. It's cool to put 60 bucks in the bank and go spend 40 bucks. Again, from my naive, non-financial advising perspective, if someone, you know, if, and, then I, and again, for illustration purposes, and this may lead into, the, you know, what you talk about into the book here, but, you know, if someone approaches you specifically at a young age or a parent of someone, at, you know, entering adulthood or around there, and says, so what do we do? Like how, how, what have we been lied to about from the banks and how we, what, what, what we should do with our money? Like what, what is the, the, like the reader's digest? I know there's probably a lot involved with it, but. I'll give you guys our four step process. And this four step process has been something that I've gone through the ringer with, but it's whether you, whether you're listening to this and have a hundred million dollars to your name or like are broke, these are the four steps that you want, want to take. So step number one, get clarity on you. As, as cliche as that sounds, the amount of people that have zero clue what they actually want, like boggles my mind. I think about, you know, the Alice in Wonderland when she's at the fork in the road and the cat's, like, you know, where do you want to go? And she's like, I don't know. He's like, well, then any road will get you there. Most people are going through their life. Most people are treating their money. Most people are just doing this whole thing and they don't even know what they want. So the first thing that we do is getting clarity on what does financial success look like for you? A question that I ask in the book is, if money wasn't an issue at all, what would you be doing? And that, that really identifies the, the step number one. Step number two, and very few people talk about this. They all, everyone wants to talk about investing. Uh, and if you were going to play golf, what's more important, the club or the swing? Most people would say the swing. And yet everyone in the financial service business is selling the club because that's how we get paid. Right. So step number two is efficiency. 
understanding the process that everything that we do as it relates to our cash flow coming in, as it relates to the assets that we have, as it relates to paying down our debts, as it relates to future purchases like college, we can go into that if you'd like, um, as it relates to every part of our life, efficiency can make or break us. And it's all about minimizing these things, which I call wealth transfers, things that we transfer our money away and understanding that when we lose a dollar, we don't just lose that dollar. We lose what that dollar could have earned us the rest of our life. So mm -hmm. most people are like, and for example, I paid cash for my car, my first car, $10,000 Ford Fusion. And, and at face value, I didn't pay any interest. Dave Ramsey would have been incredibly proud of me. But if you, if you ask the question, okay, what would that 10,000 have been worth? now to me what would that have been worth if i could have compounded the rest of my life right been worth over a hundred thousand dollars just assuming a four percent interest rate over my lifetime like so that that ten thousand dollar car has extra costs associated with that and we wouldn't be able to measure that if we didn't understand efficiency so the second step is to take someone not look at products but try to optimize every part of efficiency and find money that they're currently losing that that they they, they shouldn't be and a lot if you're an entrepreneur taxes Taxes are the biggest area where you, if you know the rules of the game, you can save money on. Um, and then there's, there's so many other areas that we can help people be more efficient, but we just want to optimize that efficiency. Then the third area, and this is where, you know, Dave Ramsey talks about, this is where Tony Robbins talks about, this is where I'm big on, this is what Richest Man in Babylon talks about, is paying yourself first. Like, get in the mindset to pay yourself. Like, save that money. Robert Kiyosaki says savers are losers because if all you do is just save your money and that's where it ends, you will be a loser. But if you don't get in the habit of actually getting that money somewhere, building that capital, you're not going to be able to do anything in the future. Like you're just going to be on this treadmill for life. Right. And so we get our clients to start saving their money. I, in my book, I, I show people a special type of place to save that money where you can actually let it grow for the rest of your life and use it at the same time. It's a special type of life insurance contract. When you set it up properly, it's amazing. But whether it's that, whether it's a savings account, regardless of what that is, we want to put our money in a place that ultimately will give long-term effects, but also give us the short-term ability to use our money. And then the fourth area is use and investing. And we want to be able to find the areas that we should invest in. And this is where I'm my biggest kickback to what Tony Robbins is teaching and Dave Ramsey is teaching is they're telling entrepreneurs like you to, you know, work your butt off, make money, and then put it in someone else's business, diversify. <laughs> and, and I, I think we need to, you know, really get clear on what's our number one investment. I think a lot of people listening to that, that's themselves, yeah. their business, the messages that they care about. And so we at our company, I mean, we teach people how to do option trading and real estate. And if that's, if that's your thing, great. We can help you be more efficient with that. But for most people that come to us, we show them how to reinvest in their business, but do it in such a way where they're getting long-term compounding, but they're also getting their, what they're getting their investing, they're investing in themselves. It's the only way to really capture the future and the present. And that's kind of what, why I do what I do, wrote, wrote the book, and we go through the process. And so it's, it's getting clarity, being efficient, saving your money, and multiplying it. And th those are the four-step process. And um, we could go way more in depth, but for, for the overview, that's, that's kind of a good summary. No, we, we want people to buy the book. We can't, we can't tell them all everything <laughs> that's in it. So, so what was the basis for the book? You just felt like you had so much in there. You just had to get it out. Um, and obviously, that we, or was it the obvious next step? Uh, was let's Nothing in the book is my my idea like, okay all the things that I've learned and what I found is most people in our business totally suck at actually like explaining explaining things because they're because we have this like it's so simple and if you understand how simple it is you're like man Caleb's actually not a financial prodigy like he's not like he's just like I just got lucky and learned from some amazing people but sure. the book, all it is is it's me learning from all these amazing people and putting it packaging it together in a way that I can understand. And I've gotten so, so much good feedback from like, Caleb, like, this is really simple stuff. And I it finally made sense. And I'm like, I'll own that. I'm not a rocket. I mean, being being dyslexic is a huge advantage when you're writing because you can't get that technical. Right? No, I, I, I'm not a reader. I mean, I'm I try to be I, I'm, I've been getting into audio books. I'm a published author, not a reader. Yeah. So I forced myself to I found one good hack is um, um, but when I get, as soon as I get to the gym, if I just, if I just beeline it for the treadmill and just walk for 30 minutes and read, yep. 
Awesome. Um, I'm warming up and I'm getting 30 minutes of reading in at the same yep. time. Uh, if I'm really lazy that day, it's considered 30 minutes of exercise, according to my Apple Watch, right? Yep. So, hey, th those of you just tuning in here, I'm chatting with my buddy, Caleb Williams, author of The And Asset, The Secret Way to Save and Use Your Money at the Same Time. I, I say that plug just in the event you're one of those weirdos that just tunes into a podcast in the middle of the show. I probably told you all about Caleb already. So, um, why did you name it The And Asset? asset and and what what is the secret way to save and use your money at the same time so if you think about what most people invest in it's 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 or assets so let me explain if you invest in the stock market it's your money is in the stock market and if you take that out it's no longer in the stock market if your money is in a savings account and you take it out it's no longer in savings there, when I talk about the third aspect of the life insurance piece, life insurance is super misunderstood. Like it was misunderstood for me. And I was like, why would anyone want to put their money in life insurance? Like that's the worst place to put your money. Well, it turns out if you actually know what's going on and you structure these things with the right companies and set them up properly, it's one of the best places to save your money, not invest, but save your money. And your money is literally going to grow tax-free the rest of your life, which is pretty cool. If you look at where our country's at and the taxation. But it also, there's, there's a provision in that kind of life insurance contract that allows you to borrow against your money. Well, if it's set up properly, you can borrow against your money and your money can continue to grow. So what you're, what you're essentially doing is you're taking all your money from efficiency, putting in a place that's going to grow not just to retirement, but to the day that you die tax-free and gives you the ability to utilize that capital while your money's continuing to grow to invest in things like your business or things that will get a greater ROI. So we're showing you how to use $1 in more than one places. And so it's another way of explaining that. And the aha moment to me is when I didn't have to choose, I didn't have to make this false choice between saving for the future and using my money in the present. And a ton of entrepreneurs are, have this dilemma. They're like, I, I have nothing for the future, but I don't want to just take my money, give it to someone else and just forfeit my dreams. And right. so it, it, it's finally a solution to stop forfeiting your dreams between the future and now. So you just turned 40 years old, you're an entrepreneur and you're getting ready to put your 18 year old in college and college is 15 to $18,000 a year. Yeah. My naive financial brain says, well, can I take that 15 or 18,000 a year, put it into an interest bearing account and pull it out and pay it off when I'm, when she's done. Um, I asked a, my financial advisor that's in my, in my networking group about that. He said, well, you know, you've got to, you know, you, you, you're, you're not going to find an account that's going to bring you any return that would allow you to do that. Plus you're putting the money at risk because we're, you know, we're at the brink of another recession slightly and right. in four years, the money could not be available. So then, you know, what do you tell your kid? Yeah. Um, so yeah. that, that, that was his immediate response. So I was like, all right, let me not put together any more financial plans for college and let's find somebody yeah. with an answer. So what, 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 what would you say? I mean, is there, is there any off the cuff things that, you know, are, are, are hacks, if you will, on 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 college these days the conversation is so uh jumbled these days right do you need college yeah. you don't need college yeah so listen if you're most most people saving for college uh invest in what's called a 529 plan which yeah. is it's a it's like a it's a special type of plan that gives you tax advantages for saving for your kid and you have to use it for college meaning right. if you don't use it for college you lose the, the benefits um and so here's the problem with that, the mindset of investing in a Roth or 529 plan for college, okay? You're, you're saving money and whether, I mean, you guys are a little bit late to the game. Let's say, it, you know, your kid's 10 years old or just starting off and you're saving your money and it does grow. And at college, you take that money out and pay for college. Awesome. But, but do you realize that you just forfeited 60, 70, maybe 80 years of compounding on what that dollar could have grown to? Yeah. Like, yeah. and, and that doesn't like, I, I want, I want this to like, I'm literally am nerding out right now. If you had $20,000 and we could assume a 5% interest rate over, um, let's say 60 years. And so you paid, you just paid that. And there was an account you paid for college. Okay. Would you know the, what that 20,000 would have grown to over 60 years? Hmm. Over $370,000. Wow. Over, and, and by the way, $20,000 for college is super cheap. Right. So my problem with college is a short term mindset of saving and then draining your account to pay for college. If you understand what I'm talking about in the game, you will be able to have that 20,000 available to get, still get college because you're and you know, that's a specialized knowledge. Hopefully you'll be able to learn more because you have that college degree. 
but you'll also be able to, that 20,000, you won't disrespect what that would be worth in 60 years. And right. so my biggest problem with most people in college is they're saving their money and then draining it. Whereas I think if you understand the rules of the game, you should be saving your money in a place that you have access to it, but that money will continue to grow for the rest of your life. And I just saved you over $370,000 by just getting you to think long-term instead of short-term. Does sure. that make sense? Yeah, it definitely does. And, 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 and do you, is, is this strategy revealed in, in, yeah. in the book? Yeah. So for someone like you, just read chapter seven. Okay. <laughs> It's, it's oh, I know even, what I'm doing even colored. The pictures are colored. <laughs> <laughs> There's pictures too. I'm totally going to read. Uh, yeah. this, is, uh, this, is, this is great stuff. I never, again, never even thought about that. I mean, again, you've always, I think as an, uh, as an entrepreneur or some entrepreneurs or business people, you want to have the mentality of, yeah, I want to put my money to work for me. But my, my, you know, the only time I think about that outside of this whole, like what, you know, there's a, is there a better way to save $80,000 within four years and make a return and still pay for college? That was, that's been my most recent, but above and beyond that was, okay. So when things do start to dip a bit and the market starts to adjust on here, being able to go around to the real estate market, like Pac-Man and yeah. build a portfolio, I think is a great way to really long-term it, right? That takes cash flow. Right. But if you're saving your money the right way and borrowing on the money that you're saving, you've got money to invest. So you're doing, you're achieving both goals. Right. And, and, and one of my favorite quotes is when you have access to capital, opportunity will seek you out. Like literally here's, here's an amazing investment strategy. Don't invest and wait. I, I'm serious. What's going to happen. And I don't know when, but what is going to happen? The people that have money are going to be very wealthy in the next five years if they wait and look for opportunities. Sure. I, I mean, where do you think the market's headed? I, I don't think that, I mean, again, from what I'm told, it's not going to be as bad as 2008, but there's always an adjustment. I, I mean, I, I, we were listening from different people. I, I don't know. This, this is what I do know is the tax situation in our country. No one wants to talk about because it's not popular, but like being conservative myself, like we are our tax situation. is like, we're, we're screwed. Like we are literally, if you look at our unfunded liabilities as a country, like we don't, like, I don't know how we're going to get through it, right? We can either, we need either stop spending, which we're not going to do, or raise taxes. So the biggest threat to someone's financial wealth, just take the markets out of it, biggest threat are the people that are deferring taxes, any qualified plan, IRA, 401k, do you know what you're doing? You're not only giving up total control, you're hoping that the market grows, but you're, you're pretty much saying, I'm going to pay whatever tax rate I need to in retirement. And if you're telling me that taxes aren't going to increase long term, like that's a huge, you know, big difference. So a big thing that I look at is just get our money off the radar screen, the IRS. But then as it relates to, as it relates to the market and you look at where the federal reserves at, I think we could be in for even a bigger correction because when you think about it, the, um, the federal reserve bailed, bailed our country out by printing more money yeah. and interest rates have been low for so long. I, like I've heard that when the market does correct it could be just as bad if not worse than 2008 but again wow. it's it's but again that's my opinion versus like it i don't know you know i don't so do you think technology and the way that we the world operates in such a rapid rate and you know technology improving things has any effect i mean the, the, the you know that was a now i think about that a lot it was a recession that was 11 years ago but we were we were in a very 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 different place does that i mean is it is it two different topics do you i mean two different subjects yeah i i'm that's a good question i'm not Again, it, it, what's really interesting to me is we have, a, we have some big companies like Amazon and Apple and Google, and they're just starting to swallow up other companies and other companies. And I don't know what that's going to do long term. Um, he, I'm an optimist, so it might sound like I'm pessimistic right now. I, th I think we live in the greatest era. No, I mean, yeah. like, there's no way I would trade any other time sure. for this. I just want people to start taking more responsibility over their money. And here's what I can, this is, this is what I can bank on. We live in the value economy. So as long as you have the mindset of creating value, you're going to be fine. I don't care if our dollar goes away. Like we, that will always, you know, be a fact. So sure. if you create value and then my pushback for retirement, cause I, I think retirement is messed up too. That mindset of like, like if you're creating value, why would you ever want to retire from creating value? <laughs> right, 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 right. You hate what you're doing and sure. we only live once. So why don't we restart rethinking like, why we're doing what we're doing. So th those are the kind of things that, again, might sound crazy, but like, I just, again, the reason why you and I are going to be okay, no matter what happens, is we are committed to creating value in the world. And sure. that's why we're doing all, that's why we're going to do okay. 
you know, my, my buddy Gary V always says that, you know, your personal brand is, is in perpetuity is, is your reputation. And so everybody, when, when, whatever, whatever correction or recession, whatever you want to call it starts to happen, those that have invested in their personal brand, because brands are built by what, by providing value. Um, and, and I, he, he talks a lot about that. And he also talks about how he's going to buy the jets and that his, you know, his plan, or at least the idea of the plan, which keeps him going, as he would say, is, the, is being able to take brands that have taken a nosedive, dive in, buy them for pennies on the dollar, resuscitate them. Uh, and then put them in his portfolio. And as those com- companies grow, because he's turned them around, he's going to take the cash and buy the jets. Um, I said, well, you've already started with K-Swiss. I mean, not the K-Swiss was done, but I hadn't heard of K-Swiss since I was like 10. Yeah. <laughs> so I have, I have two pairs of K-Swiss because of Gary. This you see? Gary. Yeah, I, I, I was, uh, I'm buddies with his sister too. And she, she posted something last night about the new ones that are going to drop in, in uh, next month, the high tops. Okay. She's like, I haven't worn high tops in forever. And I'm like, I think I got a bow tie to match both of these. <laughs> so we were like chatting about it. And I'm like, it's just amazing. And they're like, they're, uh, they say something about um, op- their optimism and something. I don't know what the name of it is. But again, this whole theme of like what he lives um, is, is playing out to these sneakers. So it'll be fun to see how it all plays out. Uh, well, uh, listeners, uh, the book's available uh, wherever books are sold. Amazon? Yeah, Amazon, the best place to get the book is and asset.com a n d asset a s s e t dot com and that's gonna that link's gonna be in the uh, in the show notes so uh you heard it right from the man himself the best place to buy that yes you don't have to get everything on amazon you can in fact go other places to buy this definitely pick up a copy here chances are you're listening to this podcast right now because something piqued your interest with the title of the actual episode. Why? Because I would say probably a good lion's share of, I don't know, everyone has some sort of financial challenge and is just doing it wrong. And if you're an entrepreneur, chances are you're just wondering how you're going to eat this week. So pick up the book, figure out a way to get your money to go to work for you while still using your money. Because I'm saying this right now, but I'm actually going to go figure out a way to get this into play. I got a kid to put through college. My goodness, who's the guy that kind of dough, right? Well, hey, Caleb, listen, man, it's so great uh, to connect with you, dude. I mean, that's just 15 years ago, if you're like, I just, I connected with somebody based on a post on this thing called Facebook. It was a picture online through a mutual friend. People would go, huh? Like this same age is like, Hey, I met Caleb through my buddy's post on Facebook. It was so random. So, um, I mean, it was a privilege to, to, to connect with you and I really appreciate your time. I look forward to digging in the book. I am committed uh, to spending my 30 minutes uh, on the treadmill every morning before I start my workout uh, for my reading material here of the and asset from Caleb Williams. Um, and it's the secret way to save and use your money at the same time. If that sentence in and of itself doesn't make sense to you, well, then you may just need to wake up. Hey, Caleb, uh, thanks again, brother. And let's, uh, let's, let's stay in touch. We'll have to have you back on the show. Dude, thank you so much for having me. It was fun. And anything that I can do for you or your audience, know that I'll do it in a heartbeat. Awesome, brother. I appreciate that, man. Hey friends, Sebastian here. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. I sure do appreciate it. Hey, if you haven't done so already, make sure you're subscribed to the show wherever you consume podcasts. Uh, if you feel so inclined, please do re- leave us a review. Five stars is obviously preferred. Say something nice about us if you don't mind. And also make sure you're subscribed this way you're getting future updates of episodes as they become available. I'm signing off from our studio here in beautiful Coral Gables, Florida. Talk to you next time.